Okay. Edwin, we can start. It's nine. Uh, seven. Okay. Seven. Okay, we start. Okay, first of all, uh, I want to uh, say hello to everyone. We have a very, very big day today. We have a name like Professor Schnacke today, a very important and very big name in the field of spine surgery worldwide. Uh, I want to say that he's currently worldwide number one uh, expert in the subject that we're talking today. So I want to make the introduction. Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our online conference today. Before giving the floor to our dear guest, I want to introduce our team. I will be the moderator of today's conference. My name is Edwin Vasvi. I finished my neurosurgery residency one year ago in Varna University, and now I'm working as a neurosurgeon in Varna. These online education meetings have started with Professor Hassan Kiam Sujo, the program manager of the neurosurgery department of Izmir, Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital, and goes on with the contributions of all the residents, also with the contributions of the neurosurgeons who graduated from the same department, also neurosurgeons and neurosurgery residents from nearby countries, Pakistan, Georgia, and Bulgaria like me. I kindly ask you to keep your microphones turned off during the presentation of the lecture to avoid voice and noise pollution. You can ask your questions not by turning on your microphones, but by writing to the chat part of the Zoom program. At the end of the presentation, your questions will be asked to the lecture and will be discussed. Mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meetings. Please do not ask for your microphone to be turned on. Now I will try to introduce Professor Klaus Schnacke. He has countless publications and numerous awards. He is one of the most prolific experts in the spine surgery. It is my privilege to present our lecturer, Professor Klaus Schnacke. He is certified orthopedic and trauma surgeon, certified general surgeon, and he has excellent certificate of the German Spine Society. Currently, he is head in the Center of Spinal and Scoliosis Surgery in Malteser Walden Krankenhaus, Marien Erlangen, Germany. He has finished medical school in Hanover in Germany. Later on, he has been working in the Department in, of Traumatology and Reconstructive Surgery in Charité in Berlin, Germany. In 2002, he has been working in orthopedic and spine surgery University Hospital Basel in Switzerland. 2003-2004, he has been working in Center of Musculoskeletal Surgeries, Orthopedic Surgery in Charité, Berlin, Germany. He has been working also in numerous more hospitals in Germany. His thesis in habilitation is about city-based computer navigation of thoracic pedicle screws during 2002 in the University of Berlin in the development of classification and a score or therapeutic decision-making for osteoporotic thoracolumbar fractures. He has numerous activities in academic societies as a host of Eurospine meeting in Frankfurt, chair in Eospine Research Commission, Eospine Global Training Program, chair osteoporotic fracture working group and numerous more groups. He is in numerous member in academic societies as a North American Spine Society, Eurospine, Eurospine, and more. He is also doing editorial activities in the board of member Global Spine Journal. His research activities, he is currently in multicentral international prospective trial about the validation of osteoporotic score for, for osteoporotic fractures. Multicenter prospective randomized trial wound drainage in lumbar fusion surgery about sacral insufficiency fractures, implementation of a robotic system in the spine department, and more. He has more than 380 national and international scientific and educational oral presentations. He has uh, more than 155 PubMed listed scientific publications. His H index is 34. He's chairperson and faculty 34 times in international and national educational events. I can continue to speak, but I would like to give the word to Professor Schnacke because I can speak 
more and more for him. He's a profilic expert. So please, Professor Schnake, you can start. Edwin, thank you very much for the kind invitation and uh, the very kind words. And I would like to say hello to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, tonight to uh, give these presentations. I would like, of course, to uh, thank um, online Izmir, so in, in person of Hasan Kamil Suchu, for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure. And uh, I really hope that we will have a good discussion later on after my presentation, which I will start no, right now. So I assume you may see my screen now. Is yes. it correct? Can you see? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the talk today is about current treatment strategies for A3 and A4 thoracolumbar fractures. And um, as Edwin has already pointed out, over the last 20 years, I've been steadily working in the field of traumatology, um, formerly more in for bone healthy patients. We developed the classification together with the AO spine, knowledge from trauma. Uh, and more recently, I focus more on osteoporotic fractures because these are the ones who are even more challenging today. But Tonight, I will talk about A3 and A4 uh, thoracolumbar fractures in neurologically intact patients and, of course, in bone healthy patients. So we're not talking about elderly, it's not about osteoporotic patients. So these are my disclosures. They are not really related to the talk. So I will start with a case. Actually, this is a scene. The patient sent his picture later on. Uh, to me, he jumped from that a cliff, so that was about uh, 30 meters height. He was a young man, uh, and he jumped from the, the cliff. So he dived down to the water, but unfortunately, he sustained this T12 fracture, which you can see nicely in the images, which are supine images. He had no logical deficit, and uh, he, he came to us, and we performed a CT scan. What you can see here that it's on the CT scan that both end plates are affected as well as the posterior wall. And every time when a posterior wall is affected, we talk about, a, we call it a burst type injury. And the difference between an incomplete and a complete burst fracture is that either one or both end plates are affected. In that case, it's clearly nice and visible uh, that both end plates are affected plus posterior wall. So we will come to this in a second. This is would be a so-called A4 fracture according to AU spine thoracolumbar classification. Here we do not see any signs of PLC, posterior ligamentous complex injuries, because the interdistance or the distance between the spinous spinosis is not really wide in it. These are the coronal and the axial. You can nicely see that it's a kind of burst fracture in the top running down to a split, both end plates. And you see in the upper right image that the posterior wall is affected. However, no logical deficit. And as I said already, according to the AO spine, spine classification, we subdivide the fractures in A, B, and C. If it's an A, it's just the anterior column affected, and B would be bicolumn injury with any signs of distraction, and a C type would be any kind of translation. The um, then, well, what, what is really nice about the AOSPINE classification in comparison to other classifications that we have only nine subgroups left. The AO Margal classification, which we used to use uh, before, had 55 subgroups. So it was more an intellectual um, challenge, you know, to use it in a daily practice. Of course, other classifications were on the market as well. But today, I would say worldwide, the AO spine classification with these nine subtimes has become a kind of standard because it's relatively clear from a from a from from a treatment point of view what to do. You know that C and B type injuries are unstable and necessarily um, need any kind of surgical treatment. The greens, the A's, are typically stable to partial unstable, and this is the most debatable area, especially the three A3 and A4, the incomplete and the complete. While A0, the insignificant injuries, the A1, the wedge impaction, as well as the split fractures, are typically um, um, uh, suitable for conservative treatment. So the question remains what to do with the A3 and A4. Those are the most controversial ones, and that's why we are talking today. Um, so it's 
for us, or we think that it's quite important. And I can really say that I personally uh, was really hardly involved in making this distinction between A3 and A4. Because later on, you will see that the former studies which have been made or have been performed did not discriminate between incomplete and complete burst. But it's a tremendous difference. In general, we can say that's a kind of conclusion already that A3 are most in many, many occasions rather stable, while A4 in many, many occasions are rather unstable. So there's kind of watershed between A3 and A4. And that's what surgeons worldwide think too. So we've made a, uh, we really ask surgeons worldwide in a survey and the, the majority of, said, of them said, well, I would rather go for surgery in A4 and for conservative in A3. So it's two thirds of the surgeons thought like that. Only exemptions are like in North America where they have a strong conservative treatment in almost every cases, but like in Europe and Asia Pacific and in Latin America, complete birth structures typically undergo surgery. So we think that it's important to discriminate between A3 and A4 what has not been done before. So this is, a, I think, a very, a very good thing or very good development of this classification. So A4 means a complete burst. Both end plates are affected plus the posterior wall. So let's go back to our case. So now we can classify it. It's an AO spine A4 fracture, has a 25 degree of local kyphosis in the CT scan already. So in a supine position, not in a standing position. The question is now, how would you treat the patient? What would you do? And this definitely depends on the region you live, and the country you live, what kind of, um, what kind of uh, strategies you have, you have learned, et cetera. So this differs really worldwide. Well, the so first question is, of course, non-operative versus surgical treatment. That's the main question, of course. And here we have to say when we can always ask the literature and always look what has been published. But as a matter of fact, the, even the meta-analysis do not really help us so much they, because they say we didn't, they did not find any difference between operative and non-operative treatment of A3 and A4 TL uh, thoracolumbar fractures in logically intact patients. And again, that's one reason is because the underlying studies are really sparse. There are very few. I will come to them in a second. And they did not discriminate between A3 and A4. So Typically, there are, let's say, the majority of reviews, meta-analysis, et cetera, rely on two studies, two prospective randomized studies with outcome which was not in one study in favor for surgery, in one study in favor for conservative treatment. And the problem was that both studies are rather old. One is from 2002, the other from 2012, I think, no, 2000. 12, I think, yes. But anyway, so both came to different results, but there were only two studies. And how can we make a meta-analysis of two studies? So this doesn't really help us so much, unfortunately. And again, they dis didn't discriminate between A3 and A4. And in the, the, in the older study, the wood study, they had even long constructs with wood, with, with hooks, et cetera. So things we do not use today anymore. So what we know is that when you perform surgery, that you will definitely have a better radiological outcome. But in the long term, it does, obviously it doesn't make any difference whether you operate or not. So the question is, what helps now when we perform surgery in that case? And what is the good thing about it? Well, can we do something good for the patient if we have to say, well, the outcome after maybe one, two or three years is probably the same? And we have, we have, and we do perform surgery, or we always may have some complications. So that's the question. I will try to answer this tonight. However, if we decide ourselves to perform surgery, the next question is, do we have to do this in a classical open way like we did it before? Do we have to perform a fusion? Interestingly, the latest studies, mostly from Asia Pacific, showed that the posterior fixation alone could definitely achieve satisfactory radiological as well as clinical results. So obviously a fusion is maybe at least an attempt of the fusion from the, by the surgeon is maybe not necessary. Um, that means that percutaneous treatment could be an option. Long or short constructs? Well, typically in the older times with hooks, um, very weak systems, pedicle screw systems, 
they surgeons tended to perform long, long constructs. And this is probably one reason for the bad outcome, because if you have an open long construct with an incision like that, then that hurts, you know, of course, and that doesn't make patients really better. So what we know today is that with the current systems we have, which are either polyaxial or even better monoaxial, long or short constructs are possible and they, they do as good as a long construct. So today we have to say that long constructs are mostly not necessary anymore. I will show you some examples later. Percutaneous are open. I already answered this question a little bit. We know that percutaneous uh, stabilization works quite nicely. Not as good in terms of reduction of the fracture if you use polyaxial systems, but with the monoaxial systems, you can even reduce fractures in an anatomical way. So percutaneous works. Open surgery is mostly not necessary. And I'm talking here about neurologically intact patient where decompression is not necessary, of course. So in favor for percutaneous fixation is that the lower they have a lower infection rate, it goes faster. The patients are getting faster out of the bed. The, the, for open surgery speaks that you have on average a better correction of the, uh, of the cop angle or so of the reduction. And um, you have probably less interoperative fluoroscopy time because percutaneous treatment needs a lot of fluoroscopy if you want to place the screws in a perfect way. Next thing is whether to go for anterior or posterior surgery. Well, definitely posterior surgery is a kind of standard, of course. Anterior surgery, however, is possible, even anterior surgery alone. However, the problem with anterior surgery alone is that reduction is really difficult from the front. So to reduce a fracture from, the, from anterior is difficult and not really reliable. So the reduction typically starts with the posterior pedicle screw construct. And then there's a question whether to go from anterior. And there are some reasons, for instance, if, you, if the canal decompression was not really sufficient, or if you think about, and we'll come to this even in a second later, if you need anterior support, if you think there's anterior support necessary, then maybe anterior surgery is, uh, is indicated. However, today, anterior surgery can be performed, and I will show you in a minimal invasive way too. So the old long incisions like thoracophrenal lumbotomies are typically not necessary anymore. So what are our conclusions now? We have obviously, we have different options now for our patients. Before I show you our solution, which is the solution which we use here in, my, in our environment in Germany, which is not the solution worldwide because people have different opinions in these factors. But before we come, but I will give you the rationale behind our treatment protocol. We think, and we rely a little bit on the McCormick classification that the higher the vertebral body comminution is, that means the higher the destruction of the vertebral body and the higher the amount of kyphosis, the more likely a kyphosis remains or even uh, uh, increases if you treat conservatively. Or if you just go from posterior and you open up, you reduce it, then it's likely that this patient, they fail after a while and they go back to kyphosis because the posterior construct cannot withstand the forces. So because of this biomechanical thinking, we consider fractures with a high comminution and a high amount of kyphosis as rather unstable and therefore that they need surgery, that they should undergo surgery and maybe even a combined surgery. So that's the rationale because 80% of the load goes and runs anteriorly through the disc and the vertebral body and only 20% posterior. So the principles we typically apply here, and we have already published in 2018 in the Global Spine Journal, that's open source, you can always read it if you want to download it, if you're interested, in it, is that we say we want to achieve a long lasting stable situation if we go for surgery, we respect the load sharing principles, we, if we perform surgery, we want to do it like a perfect thing, well, maybe it's such a German thing, but anyway, we would like to have a, a perfect reduction. We, have a, we would like to restore the, the physiological alignment. We have to decompress the canal if it's indicated. We know that we can stay relatively short with our current implants, and we can do it in a minimal invasive way today. So again, let's go back to our case. So what does it in the end mean? So this guy here, this 23-year-old man, had already in the in a supine, in a 
lying position, 25 degrees of local kyphosis. That's too much. And he has a 50% comminution of the vertebral body. Again, that's too much. So we think that this patient needs surgery. And the first thing is what we do is that we perform a percutaneous posterior stabilization and reduction. So which can be done by, with different systems. However, typically we, 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 we advise to use monoaxial screws, but with polyaxial is theoretically possible. May 25 degrees is, can be difficult, but here with the, with the shunt screws and then with this percutaneous system, we were able to reduce the patient and uh, to fix it in that way. So it's a short bisegmental stabilization. Percutaneous, that's what we do right away when the patient comes, so within the first 24 to 36 hours. Why? Because afterwards the patient can stand up and can be mobilized. And it doesn't really hurt that much. So the question is now, is it okay? Is this all or does it need more? And again, our treatment strategy strategy is like that we look about that we look for comminution, that we look about how much kyphosis have we corrected, in that case, 25 degrees. Is the disc maybe damaged? Do we have any, what is about the activity status of the patient? How active is the patient? How fast does he want to go back to work, to sports activities, et cetera? And do we think about implant removal? Because when we, because when we know that, or when we see that the kyphosis and the comminution goes more than 40 to 50% down the pedicle, then we, we realize or we, for us, it's a sign that here's a really kind of unstable situation and it's likely that the patient kyphosis again. So in our, in our environment, we wanna avoid situations like that. So where we had just a posterior stabilization, but we see already that there's gas in the, in the disc. And later on, we see images like that where we have like a, 15, 20 degrees of kyphosis, sometimes with loose screws, but at the end with a patient who comes and asks for implant removal. And you perform a CT scan and you do not know whether this is now healed or not. And then you say, maybe we should leave it. Maybe we should look for another six months. So what you do is you prolong the, the sick leave of this patient because your treatment stopped maybe on the halfway or 50% of the way. And that's why we think in a situation like that, maybe more is necessary. Interesting study already published or, or shown here in 1971 in, 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 in Switzerland. Um, here results, interesting from 463 patients treated 1927 to 1948 with 420 acute fractures conservatively, of course, in those, in those days. And they had a 50% follow-up rate after on mean 16 years. Very interesting. Nobody cites the study because it was a German. <laughs> and, but it's really interesting. The results were, the conclusion were, and that's what Lorenz Böhler, kind of godfather of uh, the modern orthopedic and traumatology, at least in the German-speaking countries, Lorenz Böhler had already pointed out that, when the final kyphosis is over 15 degrees and the secondary loss is, occurs, the outcome is not good. So in general, we know, at least from this, from this um, studies, which observational studies, I would say, that the higher the local kyphosis, the higher the, the risk is that patients are not, are not happy. So therefore, we think that an anterior support in such a comminution and such a local kyphosis is, is uh, advisable. And what we do today is that we perform this in an MIS in a minimal invasive way. You can do this full thoracoscopically or what we do typically thoracoscopically assisted. It doesn't matter that much. This is a different patient, but I just show you the, the, how it works. It's uh, in, a, in a lateral position. We typically go from the left in, in the thoracolumbar junction and uh, they make an incision directly over the uh, fractured vertebral body. It's a six to seven centimeter incision. We have another port for the camera. We use a retractor system and that's how it looks like. And then we look inside the, uh, um, the, the thorax already. And here is the view. We have already removed the vertebral body and put in a cage. The expandable cage, for instance, because it's relatively easy to perform that. And this is a nine of 90 minutes surgery. 
with a blood loss of maybe 200 cc. So it's relatively easy with a very small incision. And at the end, you have scars like that. So this, this is, that's how it looks like before the patient move, uh, uh, um, gets discharged from the hospital. So it's a small incision on the, on the lateral side. There are small incisions in the back. And that's how we treat them. And that's already the x-rays X -rays after six months. And the beauty, I would say, of this treatment is that after you've done this, the situation is stable. So they can go right away back to physiotherapy, start physiotherapy, start rehabilitation. They can go back typically to work as soon as possible on average after three months. They can rather, after six months, they can do low impact sports again. After three months, they can go to the gym or whatever, and then they are more, they're actually happy and then they are done. There's no discussion about implant removal, et cetera, et cetera, anything else. You, do, you just need to perform some x-rays in the, in the follow-up. But the, 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 really the beauty is here that it's, that's a very stable situation. However, it's invasive, although we perform it minimally invasively, but it's our two surgeries. And if you're not used to do this in MIS, maybe if you are open, big open incisions, then maybe the outcome is not as good. In 2014, we published a couple of results of 45 patients. We treated like that, but in those days with open surgery. And the results were overall quite good. However, all the patients with the open incision, with the open thoracotomy, one third of them complained about thoracotomy uh, post-thoracotomy syndrome. So a big incision cause issues if you go anteriorly. So we advise to do it thoracoscopically or thoracoscopically get cystic because then that lowers the, uh, the amount or the risk of having any issues with the uh, access to a few percent. And what we know from a preliminary study of a, a prospective randomized study, that quite interesting that the uh, patients who went, underwent posterior anterior surgery had even less disability and significant better restoration of the sagittal profile in comparison to patients who were just posteriorly uh, stabilized. However, only 21 patients could be followed up in this small uh, study. So, but in practice, this is one option, as I told you. This is one option how to perform the surgery. It's a posterior anterior. It's a relatively clear algorithm. However, maybe that does not fit to all the patients. Maybe if you don't have the, the techniques available, if you're not used to do this, maybe you should think about how can I do, how can I solve this just from posterior, or maybe what about conservative treatment? And I go back to this because worldwide, not so many patients, uh, not so many surgeons perform anterior posterior surgery. So let's go back one step back and say, okay, how can we come to a decision whether to operate or not? In 2015, we have published this paper where we said, okay, let's make an algorithm, let's make a point system where we can say how, whether to operate or not. And what we did is that we gave points for each uh, subtypes of the fractures. It started with zero and ends up with eight according to type, type A, type B, type C. We have the patient-specific modifiers like M1 means uh, potential PLC, posterior ligamentous complex injury, and of course, a neurological status. And therefore, but here for us, only the type A are interesting, and here A3, A4, that means either three points or five points. And what we came up with was a kind of compromise, a worldwide compromise, I would say, because we said everything above six points should undergo surgery. That was a consens consensus of the group. Four to five points is kind of intermediate so that the Germans can operate and the Americans cannot operate. And everything below four points is conservative. So an A3 fracture itself, without any neurological deficit, without any hint of PLC injury, would get three points and therefore would treat it conservatively in this worldwide consensus. An A4 fracture would, would uh, get five points. So a pure A4 fracture may get surgical treatment or not. However, if there's a suspicion of PLC injury or even neurologically neurology, then you should un you'd go for surgery. So that's a compromise we have found uh, worldwide. And that's what we today advise the surgeons. So conservative treatment, functional conservative treatment, I would say is possible in A3 and A4 if only minor kyphosis and a few comminution exist. 
if the patient is, if you have a patient, you can mobilize him relatively quickly and he is not in that much pain. That's a good sign. You may go on with a conservative treatment. I do so. If I, if I see a patient, the first thing I try to get him out of the bed to see whether it's possible or not, because instability causes a lot of pain. And patients who are unstable, they, they do not get up. They are so much in pain, even when they turn, they say it hurts. Standing x-rays, very important. We always try to perform a standing x-ray. So before we make a decision, if a patient can be mobilized, before we make a decision to go on with conservative treatment, we perform a standing x-ray to see whether there's an ongo, how much is the deformity. And if the deformity is above 15 degrees, 20 degrees already, we assume that you will end up probably at 20, 25 degrees, and that's maybe too much. So as standing x-rays are important to see whether the deformity goes on or not. If you perform conservative treatment, please do the an, an extended x-ray after mobilization and then probably one to two weeks later to see what happens. So follow up the patients, look if they develop further kyphosis. If not, then it's fine. Then the conservative treatment will probably be, the, be sufficient. If you see ongoing kyphosis, consider surgery. Orthosis are optional. There's no evidence whatsoever to use an orthosis in a thoracolumbar fracture treatment. There is no, the only thing is that we feel better as surgeons if we give them something, but it's really doesn't make any difference. So you may think, or the patient pay me the, you can ask the patient whether he or she wants an orthosis, but don't give, don't think that orthosis will do any kind of help. No, they, they do not change anything. It's just a mental thing for you as a surgeon, maybe to prescribe one and second, maybe secondary, maybe for the patient, if they feel more safe, more comfortable, if they have an orthosis. A3 can mostly, or the incomplete burst type injuries, can mostly be managed conservatively. Some of them probably need surgery and the, the ones who need surgery are the ones with a severe kyphosis or gross comminution. If you perform, if you need surgery in an A3, mostly a posterior minimal and Xavier's construct is sufficient. I will show you some images. Stabilization can sometimes can even be monosegmentally, and then a no implant removal is necessary. However, if there the comminution is too high, maybe an anterior, maybe a bisegmental stabilization is needed, or sometimes even an anterior posterior. How that does that look like? Here is a, a fracture on the left side. This comminution was less than 40%, kyphosis standing less than 15, per, uh, 15 degrees. So we perform conservative treatment. Alternatively, if the comminution is a little bit higher or the kyphosis is higher, you can perform a monosegmental posterior percutaneous stabilization or even an open. This is just a minor incision. So that works as well. But of course, bisegmental stabilization can be performed. That's definitely an option, but in the majority of cases, I don't, I don't need it. However, if you have a severe comminution, severe kyphosis, we would advise to make an anterior additional stabilization, like you can see it, it's one example, uh, like you can see it on the right images. And the, here we take out the posterior implants after four to six months. So that the end, you have just a monosegmental fusion in the front. So that's our treatment concept in A3 fractures if they have severe kyphosis and a lot of comminution. A4, in principle or in generally speaking, I would say surgical stabilization is in the majority of cases advisable because it has predictable results and the patients get back early to work, to full weight bearing, et cetera, and no implant and removal things are necessary. So really, I think stabilization is advisable. However, we know, as I said before, that in some patients, conservative treatment will work. Fracture with the only minor kyphosis of minor comminution, they can be treated posterior only. In addition of so-called index screws, I will show you an example, enhances the stability so you can stay short. Anterior and posterior stabilization is the Ultimate, I would say that's some, what you have seen in that case, which is, uh, which is really reliable and achieves long lasting results. But if you do it completely open, then it has a lot of morbidity. So therefore, 100 percutaneous or minimal invasive surgery is something which I would say is really helpful in these patients. I would not treat the patients today with open surgery from the back and open surgery from the front. 
And then I would probably rather go for conservative treatment. But today it's not necessary anymore. We have these techniques, we can do this. So how does it look like? Conservative treatment is sometimes possible in the patient where you have a standing X-ray and it looks good. The uh, If you have images like that on the right side, you, you have uh, where you think, okay, I have a kyphosis, I want to stabilize, even a posterior stabilization is possible and it will eventually heal. You can do it even from the front, anterior, just pure anterior. That's possible in some cases as well, as I said, if you don't have so much kyphosis. The picture on the left side is the one with the index screws. Typically, I perform them typically mostly a little bit shorter, but doesn't matter. They have to be in the, in the pedicle. That's where the, the, the biggest uh, strength is. So you can here have a relatively short and stable construct. Or what some colleagues are doing today is that they make a percutaneous bisegmental stabilization, which you can see in the middle left, and with some uh, kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty. So they just put cement into the vertebral body. That has become kind of a little bit popular in some areas. The anterior posterior you have seen, I showed you. And in the thoracic spine, typically anterior surgery is mostly not necessary. Everything above, I would say, T9 rare, rarely needs any anterior surgery, but we advise for A4 fractures to have two above, two below. So the exemption from short by segmental stabilization is thoracic spine. Thoracic spine, we would say two above, two below in A4 is she's better and more reliable results than just by segmentally. This treatment recommendation has been published, as I told you, already in 2018, at least the basics, etc. You may, it's open source, as I told you, you may read them. If you can download them, if you want to read what I, or if you're interested in. Um, and with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I would hope to see you maybe in, in Frankfurt in this October at the Eurospine meeting together with Frank Anziora and Thomas Blatter, I'm the local host, and we will have a fruitful meeting there. And I uh, hope, and hopefully many Turkish surgeons and surgeons from that area, Bulgaria, Romania, et cetera, come to, uh, to Frankfurt and we'll have a good time and we can have a good chat there about further treatment of fractures. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It was a really very good presentation. Uh, it was really nice to hear all these uh, new things uh, that I heard. So I have a, a lot of questions as a neurosurgeon who is doing mainly spine surgery. I have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna ask just a few of them. So I don't want to bother the audience with my questions. First of all, I would like to ask uh, when you do, um, anterior approach, thoracotomy. Do you use thoracic surgeon or you, you do them by yourself? No, we no, we don't need thoracic surgeon. It's, as I showed you, it's a mini thoracotomy. It's six, seven centimeters, plus the uh, one incision for the camera. Um, it's really easy. Edwin, if you would come to our clinic or to the clinics here in Germany, you need probably five five surgeries and you can do it on your own. It's really easy. Technically, it's easy. Otherwise, I probably I could do it. <laughs> so it's really easy, uh, and you don't need a, a, a thoracic surgeon because even we don't up to T10, we don't even use uh, uni uh, so um, um, mono ventilation of the lung. So we just push the lung gently away. You know, that's relatively easy. Um, and then if you make the incision right above the fracture, you fall directly on the, on the, on the vertebral body. You just incise the, uh, the uh, pleura there, and then you are there. You can take out the disc and you can directly look onto the vertebral body. And since we do it in this mini open way, we have always the options you know, to have a better control if it starts bleeding from the segmental vessel, et cetera. So it's not that difficult. So to answer your questions, no, we don't need a thoracic surgeon. Okay, my next, next question is, um, I have never done fusion surgery. Mainly uh, I put bone cement as an anterior comb support. What do you think about uh, this step? Do you support it putting in A3 or A4 fractures? Yeah, <laughs> there was a funny story about that. We had long, we had the discussions like and, and that. What are the long-term uh, 
uh, opportunities? I mean, what what happens after five or ten years? Exactly. That's what we do not know. So in in general, obviously it works in uh, for one, two, three, four years. Yeah, it's been well. The issue is the bone. If you have a the, again, it depends on the destruction of the comminution of the bone, because sometimes if you have a gross comminution, then if you apply the cement, it goes all over. So you need you need a little, and if you want to lift maybe the end plate or so, you you need an end plate which is not totally destroyed. You need a vertebral body which is not totally destroyed because otherwise you put your cement somewhere and I'm not sure whether this really works from a biomechanical point. Furthermore, if you have very young patients, you have very thick discs and they if they are destroyed, what can happen is that you have a loss of correction after a while so that they start to de develop a kyphosis and maybe eventually have some screw loosening. We don't have any data yet, and we don't know whether this really makes a difference. So currently, I would say it's an option, and I know other surgeons, not only you who do this, they report from good results. We don't do it, but that doesn't yeah. mean that it's not that it's not meaningful. Yeah, in short term, the patient says they have they, they don't have pain, but uh, what happens in long term? So we don't this know is the question. We don't know, and uh, other questions. Do you always put uh, an additional pedicle screw in the fractured vertebra or you don't do this? Because I saw in last of your uh, pictures that you had. Yeah, if we, if we think there, if we say, okay, we do, not, we do not intend to go anteriorly or we are not sure yet, then we put this short index screws in the vertebral body, mostly short ones, 30 millimeters maximum, just in the pedicles because anteriorly, if you put 40 or 50 millimeter screws, there's nothing, there's a fractured bone. So that doesn't work. So you need the own, if the pedicles are still intact, you can put two short screws in the pedicles in the, in the fractured vertebral body and they enhance, enhance stability. Um, this is, we always do this if we say, okay, this patient probably is not, should not undergo any anterior surgery. Maybe because he had thoracic surgery before, he's maybe rather old, but bone stock is still good. Things like that, where we say, okay, now let's let's keep it purely dorsally, posteriorly, but make a very strong construct. So if we decide to stay in A4, only posterior, then we put this index screws. Okay, and my last question is, I'm not gonna ask more. So my last question is, uh, when you have A4 and... Uh, bone canal encroachment, I mean, a retropulsion of bone fragment, but the patient is neurologically intact. But you see that the fragment is, for example, 60 or 70 percent in the canal. Do you always do the compression or you say, okay, this patient has no uh, neurological deficit, I'm not going to do the compression? What, what is the strategy? So, once it depends a little bit on your environment and how how possible it is that you know you have any lawsuits etc so but let's just focus on the medical on the or the on the scientific thing the younger the patient the more likely that the canal would get remodeled so a young patient you can if you reduce it you have ligamental taxis the 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 the, the, frag, the fragment moves anterior a little bit and if you have a stable situation it remodels and even after two or three years the canal encroachment is wall is gone. This works in young patient. We do not know where the watershed is, but probably like 40, maybe 50, but then it doesn't work anymore. So the older the patient, the more I would suggest to perform decompression or, or even push the fragment anteriorly because remodeling of the spinal canal is something which happens in younger patients, but not in the older ones. In the older ones, they cause, they get, they get spinal canal stenosis and probably some issues. So in generally, in younger patients, you don't need to do this. Reduction is enough. The older the patients, the more aggressive I would, be, I would become and uh, start with the decompression. The exemption is if you have a flipped, uh, if you have a flipped um, uh, posterior oh, wall. Yes. So this reverse cortical sign, this is uh, this is something of it. So if it's then it's a, the posterior ligament is ruptured and then it's flipped, and that there's no way to push this forward or whatever, then you need to remove it or decompress. But this is not that often. Okay, thank you. I'm going to start to ask yeah. the questions. Edwin, from... Yes, uh, if you uh, excuse me, I want to uh, give the floor. Uh, oh, 
from international uh, speakers and you know our meetings are really international and first of all from georgia jacob and then you will ask something okay. from the chat and then i will give the floor another okay nation jacob hello 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 hey uh, is a neurosurgeon was... from georgia thank you for Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for uh, such kind of interesting lecture. Uh, uh, really, it, it was uh, very interesting for us. As a neurosurgeon, uh, of, uh, of course, for us, more familiar is posterior approach. Okay, you say that uh, uh, anterior transthoracic approach is easy, but, uh, but nowadays, I think, uh, uh, it's very, very rare uh, when, when you need it uh, in trauma cases. For example, uh, to be honest, for me, uh, A4, A4 thoraco, thoraco lumbar junction uh, fracture, uh, I mean, transit zone, uh, it, uh, for me, it's, um, uh, we, are, we are approaching first line more aggressive. I mean, to level above, to level below to avoid anterior uh, anterior approach but of course it's very nice uh, and as you as i see it's require uh, uh, retractor system uh, also it's very very expensive for us uh, but uh, for for uh, neurosurgical point of view if you if you approach more aggressive I mean, uh, to uh, to uh, to level above, to level uh, below, you can avoid uh, uh, further uh, anterior approach. What do you think about about it? Yes, of course. I mean, I'm aware that anterior additional anterior approach is not feasible in in many situations for several reasons. I'm absolutely aware. It's like we are talking about driving. A car and they showed you okay that's a mercedes you know but you can drive with a volkswagen or whatever quite as good so they are of course there are different options you know um so from as i said i don't think that you need to above to below if you stay if you want to stay from posterior you can have this short index screws and what we know so far from kind of preliminary studies not really good ones is that it works as good as to the two above to below so we do not in the thoracolumbar junction. So everything below T10, we do not go if we stay just posterior. We do not do two above, two below. So we, we just bisegmental plus the index screws. Only in the uppers in this thoracic spine, as I said before, we perform two above, two below. So I think you may start or think about staying shorter because that's even better for the patient if you save segments. <laughs> and uh, put an index screws in the vertebral body. So that would be my my advice. Or... Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Edwin, uh, I also uh, want to hear from Andrew Netluk. He is a neurosurgeon from Ukraine, Ukraine. And I want to ask him how are the things in Ukraine nowadays in the on the subject of spinal fractures. Andrew? Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. Hello. Good evening, Hassan. Nice to Hi. see you. Thank you to Klaus for the nice and very comprehensive lecture. Uh, we use uh, uh, many options for spinal trauma. Uh, of course, the majority of cases are uh, performed uh, by posterior approach with transpedicular screws and we are satisfied with result uh, and uh, one of the question is uh, from me what uh, uh, do you recommend for patient with uh, fracture and uh, background osteoporosis uh, severe osteoporosis what uh, uh, what measures would you take to 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 ameliorate and the, the your uh, fusion 
Okay, so, and thank you, Andre. It's um, that's very important, but it's it's a total different topic, and we could have another half an hour talk about that. But anyway, just to try to be comprehensive and short. Um, yes, the the more the higher the or the lower the bone quality, so the severe the so osteoporosis, the longer the construct gets, and we use bone cement. We so we have cannulated screws or fenestrated screws, and we put the uh, cement through. You can put in cement and then put in the screw. That's another option if you don't have fenestrated screws, but mostly today we have fenestrated screws. So we use PMMA augmented screws, and we get longer. So here, a kind of standard is in kind of complete burst type fractures. We have our own classification, so OF4, what we call them. These kind of complete burst fractures are going to be... Um, uh, um, classified according to the osteoporotic fracture classification, and this says over four, and then we would say two above, two below. You know? And then with at least the uppermost and lowermost screws should be cemented. You know, We do not, cem we started to cement all the screws, but this is not that good because cement can run or moves out of the sc screws and then cause issues like cement embolias, et cetera. So, but the uppermost and lowermost screws should be um, uh, cemented. and do not what do not try to reduce the fracture anatomically because if you do so you lift it up and then you have a lot of power a lot of force on the screws and then they cut out and furthermore you need and then you need really anterior support so what we do in the majority of cases is that we have a bisegmental or or three segmental stabilization and then put a kyphoplasty so as uh, jacob said what he's doing in the normal fractures, that's what we're doing in the elderly. We put in cement, either vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty, and then put the screws, minimum two above, or one above, one below, or maybe even two above, two below, and use some cement for the screws as well. So this kind of hybrid construct, we call it. Yeah, so, so same, same thank you, Andre, and good luck in Ukraine. Yes, thank you for support, thank you. Yes. We support you as good as we can. Edwin? Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks to our uh, online contributors. So um, please, when you write your questions or your comments, please uh, add your name in the hospital which you are working, please. So there is a contribution from Harshat Parekh. He says, have regards from Dr. Harshad Parik from Mumbai, India, okay? He says, thank you. Uh, there is a Windows 7, hello everyone. Sir, for, there is a question from Efejan Erishkan. He is working with Professor Hassan Kamil Sujun Izmir. Uh, so, sir, thank you for interesting lecture. What do you think about kyphoplasty option on H3 fractures? In uh, in healthy, also in younger patients. Yeah. Um, again, so again, the I'm not in favor for just pure kyphoplasty. I can I, I can as understand the rationale if you have a complete burst and you pay, may put screws and make a kyphovertebroplasty. No, no, no. Standalone kyphoplasty. Exactly. But I ha I'm not I'm not in favor for a standalone kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty in young patients as standalone because the bone in young patient can heal. So why should we put in cement? What that's the difference between the elderly and the younger patients. In the elderly, the osteoporotic, the bone doesn't really heal well. But in the younger patients, what we see always is that bone heals. So why should we put in cement? That's just a kind of pain treatment in the beginning. But I would say in the young patient, I can then the bone can heal. What doesn't heal and what you can't affect with your cement is the discs and the kyphosis. So the issue is that you have kyphosis and you have a ruptured disc. You do not, you do not um, address this with your kypho or vertebroplasty. The only thing you do is you put in cement. It doesn't hurt so much. That's true. But the bone would heal anyway. So in that case, so either... The patient has is not in kyphosis has and has some pain. I would say wait because the pain will gone and the bone will heal. Or if he has kyphosis, then he needs screws, in my opinion. But standalone kyphoplasty in young patients in A3 
I do not understand the rationale, except that they have, that's a pain treatment. Do you understand what I mean? So yeah. that's my rationale. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So that's... there is a contribution from Haluk Berg, Professor Berg, he uh, says thank you. Edwin, Haluk Berg will ask. He's here, yeah. yeah, you can unmute. Please, Professor Berg. Yes. Hi, Klaus. Uh, I enjoyed your speech, really. Uh, thank you, as always. Uh, Edwin, which which uh, one are you talking about? I had several ones. So one, first, one of them you, is uh, is the uh, related to the kyphoplasty issue, uh, because I know Camille is using. Uh, uh, kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty for the younger patients in trauma. And we have uh, ongoing discussion with him. As you said, the uh, healing potential of the young bone uh, can be hampered by the uh, vertebroplasty. So I wondered, what is your lower age limit in uh, injecting cement? Um it really doesn't depend on the age. It yeah. Ideally, it depends on the bone mineral density. Yeah. So uh, a Hounsfield unit below uh, 110 or a T-score below minus 2.5 would be definitely the threshold. Um, when it's, if we don't have this measurement, then it gets a little bit difficult. And probably it's like 55, 60 years old in female and probably 65, 70 years old in male, maybe so on average. Or if you if you sometimes you can see already the osteoporosis on look just looking on the on the images, you know, on CT scan. Mm -hmm. Or if you intraoperatively, if you perform putting in screws, you realize that there's the the uh, the the uh, torque moment is relatively uh, low. So Ideally, you have a bone mineral measurement. You can say, okay, CT less than 110 is 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 definitely something where you sh where you can start thinking about putting in cement. And sometimes the 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 morphology of the fractures is different. So if you look at our classification, you see that the the osteoporotic patients have more a deformity rather than really fractures. So sometimes you can already realize that this fracture doesn't look like a normal A3 fracture. It's like more deformation. And mm -hmm. it's uh, with, with not that typical cracks or fracture lines, but more like with bulging, et cetera. <clears throat> so that's why we're talking in the classification about deformation rather than about fracture. So these are like signs where I would say, okay, if you see something like this, older patient, or you have the CT scan or whatever, or BMD, a bone mineral density measurement, or you see that it really looks like a osteoporotic, then I would go for cement. Yeah. And can I ask another question, uh, Edwin? Yes, of course, Professor Berg. Okay. And uh, I know th and, uh, that you're using the load sharing uh, yeah. and not maybe directly integrated with the iosis, but uh, I have problems in uh, load sharing classification of Mark Gorman. Three components of which two of them are uh, preoperative or the pre reduction. Yeah. So the but the third one comes after the reduction. But the total number seven comes with the sum of these three components. So how can you judge from a non-operated fracture that it needs an anterior support? Ah, look, you're absolutely right. That's why I pointed out, I only showed the two of the yes, two, three criteria. Two of them. And I didn't tell anything about points because I yeah. absolutely agree. And furthermore, this classification was based was made retrospectively, but in twenty seven cases. So yeah. that's definitely a very weak fundament <laughs> to talk about. Absolutely, but I I pointed this out to because our common thinking, and that's what we have what we see in our surveys when we ask international surgeons as well as here, is that when they when it comes to the decision whether to operate or not, what are the surgeons looking for? 
they're looking for kyphosis and comminution. Mm -hmm. So we have made a survey, an international survey between 22 experts or 30 yeah. actually experts. And at the end, what, what was the result? They operate on fractures, i.e. four fractures, if the, if the kyphosis is severe, typically 20, 25 degrees, or if they have, uh, if they have the of a comminution of more than 40, 50%. So although the, this classification on McCormick is not really good, the, the, the principles with comminution and kyphosis remain and are still used in our thinking. Yep. Whether this is absolutely correct or not, whether this is the truth, and, and it, we don't know. So it's yeah, a biomechanical thing. Absolutely thinking. right, and I totally agree and support your view, because the first two can be used, but the third one is just an estimate. For instance, your cliff diver uh, patient, you have made a posterior, you might calculate if that needs an anterior surgery furthermore or not, but not at the initial stage. Uh, there's been a common, to me, a mistake to be used and uh, guide for the treatment algorithm. Th thank you for pointing out that. Thank you, Professor Berg, uh, for your good questions. So uh, next question is from uh, Baran Tashkawa. Uh, he says, thank you, professor. And if there is an adjacent segment fracture like A1 fracture, should we include this level in the fusion? Um, yes, in principle, I would say yes. So that's what we typically do. We, um, what we do is if we put a fi internal fixator stabilization below that and we have this fracture, then we think that we enhance the stiffness of the spine, and then there's a risk of that uh, this fracture moves on. So we typically include it. However, we do not fuse it. So we include it, and then after four to six months, you can take out because then it's typically healed. You can or shorten the uh, the uh, posterior stabilization, or even take it out. Yes, we typically include it. And uh, there is a contribution from uh, Ertan Seven. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Dr. Seven from ICCHU Neurosurgery Department. Nuruwah Kiosmane, he says, thank you, Professor. It was a great lecture from Izmir. Edwin, uh, there is a medical student among us from Georgia. I want to hear from her also, Mariam. She is a medical student in Georgia. Mariam? Hello, Mariam. No voice. Yeah, microphone. We cannot hear you. So until she fixes her microphone, uh, uh, I'm going to say. And, uh, Edwin, you can continue and then. Can you yes. finish your now? Yes. You can. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, thank you, doctor, for an interesting lecture uh, from you, such kind of specialist. It's really a big pleasure to listen it. Uh, so I have seen your article, one of the articles, and I have a question regarding of it. In your article, you had uh, written about transpendicular biopsies during hypoplasty or retroplasty, yes? And uh, there was uh, in results unexpected malignant diagnosis, debut. So I'm interested in, can you tell us a little bit about such kind of biopsies? Uh, would you advise the specialist to do this biopsies or not? And why? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question. That relies on osteoporotic fractures and whether if you have an osteoporotic fracture and or you think it's an osteoporotic fracture and to rule out any pathological fractures like tumors, et cetera. So yes, there's a, there's a small amount of patients uh, which have uh, malignancies where you do, can detect a malignancy. It's typically not that high. It's definitely two to 5% on average, depending a little bit on the, on the, uh, on the studies where we're looking at, we perform the systematic review. The point is that in, most of the patients, you, if you make a proper examination, and if you have, uh, if you have the history of the patients, 
you already have hints for malignancies. So if there's a kind of black box this patient, probably you should perform, you know, if it's a relatively young patient, et cetera, you may perform a biopsy. But if you have the patient in front of you, you can ask him, you can examine him, you can look at the, at the images, et cetera, then you mostly can already see that there are some hints for malignancy. And therefore we do not do it frequently. So no. in your article, you had mentioned that if the radiography uh, is not clear or the symptoms are not clear, so you are doing that. So you are advising that. So how often you don't see such kind of symptoms or how often you can see in the radiography uh, clearly all of the symptoms which uh, will help you to diagnose the patient? Yeah, I would say in our no. daily practices, maybe one out of 50. So where we, where we see that the, um, the MRI doesn't look like a classical osteoporotic fractures, you know? So we say, okay, that is, could be a malignancy. Or where we have hints like in the, uh, in the lab results for uh, plasmocytoma or anything. So we were already say, okay, that's, there are some hints so we should look at that. So, but it's not that often, I would say, and then, well, as I said, one out of 50, maybe, where we then will we perform. So in any doubt, perform a biopsy in any doubt. But in general, if there is a classical history of a 77-year-old lady, have a small fall, comes to you with an osteoporotic fracture, you can classify easily, then it, you don't have to do this. Okay, so you are trying to avoid it, Maxima. Well, yes, we are, yes. We are because... Why? It costs money and it's further effort. So we yeah. say we do it when we think it's necessary, but not on all occasions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Mario. Thank you for your contribution. I'm going to continue with uh, Jakob. He has Jacob some other questions. Has two questions and he can ask himself, Edwin. Okay. It will be easy for you. Thank you again to have a chance. Uh, what do you think uh, nowadays? Uh, is it necessary uh, to know residents' uh, freehand techniques or uh, navigation can be placed uh, nowadays? And what is it your approach? Always you are using uh, uh, navigation assisted or um, uh, still use freehand technique. Uh, and also, uh, what is it? What is it your approach? When, when you are going to remove screws after trauma instrumentation, uh, I mean, uh, as I know, German, uh, German physicians uh, sometimes say that we can leave instrumentation and they are not, uh, if you compare uh, USA, USA orthopedic surgeon always says we, can, we should remove after, after two years. I mean, uh, if fusion is uh, okay, uh, we can remove instrumentation. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So to answer the first question, so I think navigation is a great tool to learn because if you plan screws with the navigation system, you know, then you and you have images before. So I we think that navigation is a good tool. It it, it increases accuracy as well as as a learning tool as well. However, they need to put in the screws in the freehand way as well. But I personally, when I, I, 1999, I put in my first screws, but that was when navigation started. So I learned by navigation to put in the screws because I planned it on the, on the software Then I moved to the OR and I could realize, I could refine the points I've seen on the CT scan. So for me, it was a good learning tool. And so therefore it's a tool, it's a good learning tool. It keeps accuracy, but of course you, these residents should learn to put in a, learn to, to see the anatomy, to dissect the anatomy, to say, okay, here's the entry point. And that uh, should be the direction. So both is necessary. To answer the second question, implant removal, yes, maybe the American implants start to get rust or so, I don't know. We, uh, no, I don't think that it's necessary. We, we try to avoid it because the main reason for me is if you say to a patient, oh, we have now fixed your back, your fracture, but then, you know, maybe in a year or so, we have to make a, we have to, to remove the implants. Now what happens? The patient is not healed yet. He thinks, okay, I need a second surgery. So what will happen? At least in our environment, they do not start to work because it's, ah, yeah, my, they have to remove it. 
you know so it, it, it prolongs this the sickness and it doesn't really help it doesn't really help it's just the only thing which helps is of course you can earn money probably by that by doing this this might be a motivation but and for the patients sometimes feel better i've published a study in 2014 or whatever where we ask patients after implant removal and they told us yes they feel better but the symptoms were the same you know they said when they <laughs> complained about pain before that pain after implant removal so that it didn't help and furthermore what you say you perform ct scans here in germany then the, the surgeons perform ct scans to see oh is it fused and then it's not fused and then ah sorry we can't take it out because it's not really fused i showed you one image and then the patient says, oh, it's not fused i can't go i can't do any sports you know oh it can break or whatever so we say fix it and then send the patient away do a proper surgery which is last and reliable and then sleep tight you know and say to the patient you are done that's it if you want to have it re removed maybe but it's not necessary go back to your life that's the philosophy at least my one you know it's not the standard philosophy even in our environment but that's why i try to avoid to perform implant removals Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And also, if it's possible, I, I, I have one question. What's about dynamic, dynamic screws, uh, dynamic roads? Sorry. Is it still alive? Yeah. Some, some, some surgeons, as I know, still uh, using. Well, well, in dynamic, uh, so in fractures, I don't think there's really a indication. Uh, surgeons are have a lot of fantasy you know whatever you give to a surgeon he tries to think about where can he put it and can put in the screw it in or so i you know um dynamic stabilization has not shown to be superior in comparison to standard fusion or even just in degenerative spine comparison to decompression so as a matter of fact you can do it but it has no real upside so kind of avoid avoidance of adjacent segment disease that doesn't happen so it happens for other reasons but not because you put the dynamic system in even though some studies show some some advantages but in general you can say there's no real no real advantage in performing dynamic stabilization dynamic rods dynamic screws whatsoever you can do it it's maybe your philosophy or maybe someone's philosophy i've finished i don't do this anymore and Okay, I don't have the feeling that the results are getting worse. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I have uh, two questions and I'm not going to ask anymore. So, uh, and we're finishing. So, <laughs> uh, my first question is, when you see hemangioma in the vertebral body, big hemangioma, do you put pedicle screw there or you avoid it? To be honest, I don't. I have never seen really issues with uh, with with this with this um, uh, with the um, hemangioma. So um, even what I typically do is I put in a fenestrated screw, and then I always expect that it starts bleeding. It doesn't bleed that much. What I do is typically that I put some bone cement in. So I put a fenestrated screw and some bone cement and that fills up and then typically there's no issue with bleeding. But in the majority of cases, I'm not afraid of putting in screws in hemangioma. To my experience, it, it has never caused real issues. Thank you. I mean, it can, cause, it can cause an issue if, you have, if, you have, if, you, if your screw is not really in the pedicle. You know, if you open up the post, if you might too medial, for instance, so your screw is not perfectly through the pedicle and then you open up the posterior wall, then it can start bleeding in the canal. Yes. So if you have very small pedicles, you may, you know, may avoid this. But if you have big pedicles where you can put in a 6.5, whatever screw in and it's the screw goes through the pedicle, I don't think that there's any big issue. Yeah. I was trying to make triangulation and to put as far as possible as lateral to have good angulation. And uh, my last question is, uh, some patients have severe trauma and pulmonary trauma uh, with contusions, and they have neurological deficit. So uh, uh, anesthesiologists sometimes say that they cannot intubate the patient. First comes the, the pulmonary system. So what do you think in these patients who has neurological deficit 
and severe pulmonary trauma. Which comes first, neurology or uh, pulmonary system? Okay, life for limb, of course. You know, I mean, that's if I'm, I, well, that sounds a little bit weird to me because typically patients with an RRD, R, ARDS, so with a severe lung uh, contusion, et cetera, they get intubated anyway. So, so for me, that's if they have a lung, severe lung trauma, they get intubated by our anesthesiologist anyway. So then we can, we, we turn it on the, on the, on the, we turn them around and percutaneous fixation and a decompression. So this issue is not the typical issue we have. Um, so if they so, sorry, I didn't say if they have rib fractures and they have compression from the uh, from the putting pedicle screws from back. Yeah, but you can use a burr or whatever, so you don't have to you don't have to make chiropractics, you know. So you can just uh, you can use a burr and and uh, so an order and so don't no we don't we don't think that this is, no. So if if there's a life threatening pulmonary problem, then life for limp, of course. Yeah. But if it's just a couple of broken ribs and hematopneumothorax or whatsoever, then the neurology is is the more more important thing. And then we would say no, turn them right away. And as a matter of fact, do it right. Don't discuss, do it right away because time matters. And the faster you get them stabilized, the faster they can get, they can turn around, they can do all ventilations, they can mobilize them, et cetera, et cetera. If you wait three days, they are getting worse, you know, and then they're really sick. And then, then you operate in a sick patient who deteriorates off the time. So my, in such patient, polytraumatized, really heavily injured patients, I operate them at night immediately, you know, because then we are done. And posterior fixation is mostly sufficient. And then decompression, then re rehabilitation starts, and then they can take care of the lung and everything else. Okay, thank you. I'm not going to ask more questions. It was a really very fantastic presentation, sir. And it was really a pleasure to have a speaker uh, like you. Thank you very much uh, for this night. Okay, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And all the best. And uh, yeah, thank you, I think it's a good format. And hope thank to, you again for inviting. Hope to see you in real life in Izmir or in Germany. Exactly. Hopefully. Okay. Bye. 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 Take care.